This episode of UK Low Carb Podcast is sponsored by Deliciously Guilt Free. Enjoy the show. Well, everyone, I am rather excited because it's the first time I've actually met Dave Wolf. Um, we have spoken briefly in Club Clubhouse once uh, a while back there in uh, Fork in the Road. Um, but it's really exciting when you get to meet somebody sort of face to face. We're kind of doing this across the Atlantic. But, you know, it's as personal as you get in the 21st century post pandemic world. But I just want to say a massive welcome to Dave Wolf to UK Low Carb. Awesome. So excited to be here. And uh, thank you for all you've done for our community. Oh, um, Dave, do you, if, if you start like that, it's only going to go just get better and better and better. I mean, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, you too. I mean, you are, let's just be fair, you are a dietitian, right? Not a nutritionist, which is a whole different right. league dietitian. <laughs> you are quite right. a rarity. I'd say Lily, Lily Nichols and you are on the same kind of pedestal in my mind as individuals who have got a very influential position to make some changes. Um, do you want to just tell people the difference between dietitian and nutritionist firstly and the sort of qualification loopholes you have to go through to get to where you are? Yeah, so it, it just requ- it requires us to get um, a degree in nutrition and then, then spend a lot of time in a guided un- under, under a preceptor um, in doing internships in various arenas. Um, Actually, the matching, the matching process is a lot similar to those that are trying to get into med school. So it is, um, it is a little bit of a challenge to get placed and then find a preceptor to cover the X and Y and Z of the of the requirements to become an eye dietitian. Whereas I, I could, um, I could call you a nutritionist and give you a piece of paper that says that you're a nutritionist. Um, and that's a spectrum, right? So I suppose, you know, there's different levels of training in nutritionists, but actually dietitian, you have to have gone through the bare yeah, so minimum it's registered, requirements. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's, it's based on the, I think the state that you're in, maybe in, in the UK, it's across the whole country. I'm not sure, but yeah, it's it definitely, be, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a little more rigor, I think. Um, but, but that being said, I am a registered dietitian. Uh, but when I help folks, I don't necessarily wear that hat because a lot of the things that I help folks with um, are things that a lot of folks uh, don't agree are problems. Like, for instance, I right. specialize in working with sugar addicts. Like, if you pull up the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Illness, you're not going to find a substance abuse disorder that connects with food. So um, Now, that I find incredible because – Addiction, I don't, we've got so much to talk about here, but let's just go straight to addiction now then. So when people say to me, you know, substance addiction, addiction, they're thinking really about narcotics or the thing about alcohol, which, of course, you know, are very big addictions in the world right now. Um, but then there's also, of course, sex and gambling addiction, which is non-chemical, uh, I suppose, external chemical uh, in- induced addiction. It's rather right. a, a physical process happening inside you that you're addicted to. So I find, I find it interesting that food doesn't fit squarely between the two because clearly it's something you're taking and ingesting, but also it's the feelings and the cravings and the association with foods that you're also craving as well. So why, why is it, I wonder what those other four are seen as being addictions quite easily, and yet food isn't recognized in the same way? I I mean, I think there's probably a multiple, there's a lot of reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, for First of all, two thirds of America is overweight or obese. Um, so what percentage of those people do you think would meet criteria for substance abuse for food? Yeah, probably most of them. Um, yeah. Not to mention that there are plenty of normal weight food addicts or sugar addicted individuals. The other thing you're, we're looking at is stigma, right? So I think alcohol and drugs carry a very large stigma. Um, there's a criminal aspect to them, um, whether it's driving under the influence or the behaviors that humans undergo in order to maintain their addiction, whether that's stealing to acquire the substance um, or um, the financial destruction uh, of yourself and your family, which you see yeah. with gambling too. So Just, you it's talk- a social problem, isn't it? As well, I suppose. Yeah, it's yeah, it's sure. breaking families and society and it's seen as being a, sure. a net bad thing for everyone concerned. Yeah. I think food addiction does the same thing. Um, but I think the perspective that it happens in is a little different. You mentioned something I think really, really important where you, you're talking about substance addiction and then what we call process addictions, mm-hmm. which are like gambling or, or sex and love or debt, you know. Um, 
Whereas food is both, right? So food That's is... That's exactly it. Yeah, it's right in the smack in the middle of those two categories. I, right, it's a substance, yeah. right? And it's a behavior of eating. Yeah. So we, we work with folks that are substance of food addicted, and we also work with people on top of that, they're also process addicted, they're volume addicts. So it's not just like they overeat sugar and grains, yeah. um, they abuse the process of eating as well. Wow. Okay. So, so it might not be the thing they're addicted to. It might be the association with having the thing as well, because it's, I, I suppose they're feeling sad. They want to just fill up their belly with something. And so the feeling of eating is important, not necessarily the thing that they are eating, which could also be an addiction as well. Yeah. It's almost as if they get a rush out of the volume as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I want to know that I'm going to go back in time now, if that's okay, Dave, I want to find sure, out do it. You know, what brought you to this point. Why, why addiction? Why, why dietetics? Why, you know, why, what's brought this together? Can you tell us a bit about your childhood and, and a bit about your background, please? Yeah. So, um, I grew up in a family where it was our divine pleasure to feed you. <laughs> like nothing made us happier than watching you eat around the table. So yeah. um, if you go back in my family, we're rooted in Lithuania and Eastern Europe. My mm -hmm. dad's adopted, so I don't know his side, but my mom's side. And actually, I think my great grandmother was like a village cook. Wow. Like okay. She cooked for everyone, right? So, <laughs> so, that, so it started there. Um, also, my mom identified even as a kid as a compulsive overeater. Um, really that young so, okay yeah so she was going to support groups to try to get what we call abstinent or clean um for a long time as a kid so i was around that language the phone calls of people helping each other out and um and so she was always working on her food sobriety right. um, and then it was later it was later, a little later, actually, I was being, um, my sister and I were being assessed by a psychologist for ADHD. And in his write-up, he called my mom a food addict. And so that really? was, the, which was very jarring terminology to her. Um, yeah. So that's, that's part of our story. And then ultimately, she ex began to accept and love um, the terminology because that yep. fit who she was um, more than just being a compulsive overeater. Um, and so, so that's also different use of language there. See, compulsive overeater sounds to me like it's your fault. You're compulsively doing something where saying you're a food addict makes it sound like it's something that you have. Well, it's not your fault, but you are victim of, I suppose that's quite a redemptive phrase compared to, you know, compulsive eater, which sounds like a motive behind it. I don't know if yeah, I'm, I think people get but... jarred, jarred by the word <laughs> addict. You know, right. Think, okay. Too. So, um, I, I look at my life and the lives of the people that I try to help yeah. and they're not overeating compulsively. They're addicted. So, yeah. uh, I think it's the right language, but it's, it's a hard pill to swallow for a lot of folks. So, um, a lot of people will identify with both terms. My mom, when she describes who she is, she's like, um, she defines herself as a low bottom, high maintenance food addict and a person of more like wow well, let's break I that down that sorry just, just say that again sorry so let's break she that down low low yeah. bottom what's low bottom sorry kind of think about like a gutter drunk oh i see okay yeah yeah and then okay. high maintenance like it takes a lot for her to maintain her addiction right 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 okay and then a person of more like yeah. Um, at Sugar Girls Global, we say more, different, better, like always something new, something different, something shiny, something bigger, something better. Something novel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so the shock it, of the new. She always wants that new thing. So that means yeah, that we all do, it's, a hung, yeah. it's a hunger that she can never fulfill because something sure. gets boring quickly. So I grew up around that. So like right. um, it was normal. Um, and I think she did the best she could with the information she had about food. So, you know, we always had a salad, a hot vegetable, a grain and a protein, or, or there was, yeah. you know, what we thought was helpful, um, you know, at the time and, you know, you know, went through stints of like low fat dressings and this and that, or we we're just basing on the information that we had at the time that was publicly available. Um, so, but I think she always made an effort to, to feed us well. 
um, yeah. with the information that she had. And, and, um, I, I basically would get home from school every day and run downstairs, like my backpack still on winter gloves still on and grab like five packs of gummy bears and right. consume them and hide the wrappers. And I had no explanation for why I was doing that until much later in life. Like I was an apple juice junkie. Um, right. mostly everything I ate was brown, a beige, you know, like yeah. noodles, macaroni and cheese, bread, crackers. Like most, so, most, most Western kids, unfortunately, right? Yeah, and yeah, all that yeah. is like the neon kind of, you know, artificial colorings they put in their food. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so quite a co- common Western diet, I guess you could say. Yeah. So that was my childhood and it, and it, and it wasn't, um, my mom actually thought the babysitter was stealing food and it was, oh, a, really? it was, her, own, it was her own her own son because i was always lean yes um, right. so that they, i don't think they suspected anything and you said about the adhd sorry so uh was there any link between nutrition and adhd for you know like your doctor or or somebody who diagnosed you or were you put on medication or anything oh yeah i was on amphetamines for 25 years whoa um, okay yeah. i didn't expect that Plumbing yeah so i think in the first grade i started ritalin uh, oh, yeah, and yeah. then, it, you know, the medications changed. I tried different things. Um, and then most recently I had taken Adderall, but I, um, I haven't taken any of that stuff in two and a half years. Wow. So, so how do the drugs affect you? And, uh, you know, did you, did you become, I don't know what the correct terminology here is, but did you become a bit more calm or did you have less of the traits of somebody that ADHD? Did it help? Or I think did it hinder? they enabled me to focus um, they definitely wiped out my appetite. Yeah. So I think that's another reason why um, food addiction didn't look so obvious, for at least from the outside to others for me, because my appetite was so suppressed. But I made up for it at dinner. Like I would eat like two plus adult portions at supper oh, wow. every day because I was so hungry because the meds had worn off. Yes. Yeah. So, so you're then coming back down to earth of the bump, sort of stuffing your face and then sleeping and then taking the meds the next day. Not, sure, not a healthy exactly. lifestyle long term, is it really? I suppose. No, no, I mean, no. There must be a lot of people in that situation as well who get stuck in a cycle of, of medication and eating and bad sleep potentially and all the rest of it. Um, exactly. Because you so, I mean, they're, they're uppers. Yes. So yeah. essentially. Yeah. So you find that all the time. So in that case then, so what brought you into dietetics and this area? What, what, yeah. So I wanted to combine my, my desire to help, um, and my desire to cook essentially. So I initially went, I got a degree in culinary arts and then that led me to culinary nutrition. And then kind of on a whim, I uh, was, it was like, I was coming down to the deadline. I was like, I'll apply for a master's in clinical nutrition. Um, and I happened to be placed at Ohio State. So it wasn't, it wasn't, um, I don't know, it was kind of spur of the moment. I'm a pretty impulsive guy anyway, but. I love that. So it could have been many different routes. You might be working at NASA right now if it'd be in a different week, a different decision. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but thank goodness you have chosen the path you have because it's helping so many people. And I think you're probably on the frontier. And we're going to talk about addiction a bit more in detail now, but I think you're on the frontier of something pretty big because. You know, I, I don't know for sure, and I'm going to learn, I think, a lot about me in this podcast about if I actually have a, an addiction or not. And I'd like to go through that with you, if I may, if, you know, some of the sure. questions you might ask somebody in, in my position. But I honestly believe, if not me or if me, either way, many people in society now, I believe, do have a food addiction. And I've certainly known people in my life who have had or who do have food addictions. And uh, I'm convinced of it more and more that it's a real problem because, the, the the change in their their character around food is incredible to the point where I think, wow, you've got no control of something. And that that to me is very suggestive of an addiction. So let's crack into then firstly, can you explain to me in layman's terms, but in a mind I'm not qualified to your level at all in this, um, what is the physical side in the brain with regards to addiction? And then maybe we could talk about the psychological as well. So the physical sure. brain and then the psychological brain. Sure. I think it all it all ties in together. And I actually think that addicts have really special brains. I I think that um, initially we are hardwired for survival. We mm-hmm. were probably the people um, that survived. 
Like we but, are just, we're tenacious individuals. Yeah. Um, so I think we have a really special brain. So essentially we could break the brain down into like these three main parts. So the first part we'll talk about is the brain stem. It connects the brain and the spinal column. Um, it's responsible for primitive functioning. I mean, really basic stuff like your breathing, your respiratory rate, your heart rate, your body temperature, your blood pressure. So for individuals that have a brain stem stroke, um, they have a really hard time living off a ventilator. Like they can't function. Um, so it's very basic, um, life sustaining, um, actions, right? So then above that, we have something that's called the limbic system. So no, the that's limbic like the, the most basic brain, isn't it? It's not like the sort of the chimp brain, like the most pre or basic evolved part of the brain, I think. Is that right? The limbic system? Limbic system, yeah, the limbic yeah. system is essentially it's it's not life sustaining in terms of breathing and blood pressure, but it's more like instincts. It's more like um, emotional regulation, survival in the sense of we need food, we need shelter. So it's very it's very primitive. And then on top of that, so if you've ever had a dog, like a dog's highest level of functioning is like instinct. It's like if I get a cookie, if I sit down, I get a cookie. If I lie down, I get a cookie. Yeah, if I do something yeah. wrong, I don't get a cookie. I get punished. Right. So the it's cause very, and effect reward from experience, right, and right, that's right, it. Right. Yeah, and then drives right. to make you want to do something. Okay. Exactly. And so then we this this amazing um, brain, this human brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is why we have four heads. Right. It's it's logic. It's it's thinking. It's manipulating our environments. It's it's all these things, and humans have it, and and higher functioning apes have it. Right. So um, that's what separates us from a dog. Like a dog can't necessarily manipulate its environment um, yep. to store food, or like we can do that. And also, there's there's a I suppose what you're also saying is there's no sense of the future for a dog. It's just literally the here and now. Whereas we can store the food because we know that in a month from now, we're not going to have the food. That's right, a huge right, difference. Right. Exactly. It? Exactly. Right. So it, I think it separates us from wild animals, you know, in yeah. that regard. Mm -hmm. um, there are some wild chimps, but you get the idea. Right. Yeah. And then, and so the addiction sits in, in the limbic system, right? So it, it, it takes over the system responsible for instincts. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden um, our pleasure center is in charge. And so, so I can't think my way out of my cravings. It's not possible. Oh, it's a different part of your brain, of course. Yeah. It's right, like right. another it's, part of your brain talking about a problem that another part of your brain has got. It can't it's work. Seen, it? It's seen as closer to essential. Yeah. So the limbic system, is it trumps our thinking. So it's like I'm on the way to the store to pick up drug foods while I'm telling myself, Dave, don't go to the store. Yeah. Right, my whole way there, I'm telling myself, "Don't do this. This is a bad idea. You know how this is going to end." Right, that's my human brain. Do you remember but this my... yesterday, Dave? Do you remember this two days ago, Dave? Like seriously, you're doing it again. Have you ever read the Chimp Paradox by Prof. Steve Peters? Uh, no, I don't. Yes, yeah, Steve so. Peters. I recommend it. It's it's written. It's basically what we're talking about at your level, but it's written as a layperson's level for us. And uh, it talks about the chimp brain versus the human brain. It describes exactly that point that your chimp brain, the limbic brain, is is much more powerful and willpower is nonsense because the chimp right. brain will win. So unless you change right. your environment and it's not there anymore, your chimp's going to win because it's just going to happen. Your chimp's like, exactly. I want to eat that. Bang. Right. And then, exactly. you, then afterwards, you're like, you feel the remorse and the regret because your human right, brain is right. saying, what are you doing? Why'd you do that? We, we've got a yeah. plan here, guys. We're doing so well. And you, you just let us down, you know? Right. Shame, guilt, remorse, regret, yeah, yeah, all that yeah. stuff. And then yeah. what does that lead us back to? More well, food. We do it again so, to comfort yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We have a hole we need to fill. It's depressing. Injury, so I think it? that's <laughs> the basic, the basics of the brain. And, and I think you can get more complicated. You get into molecules like dopamine and, and molecules like oxytocin and and but um from the, from a basic level you need to understand that your your system that's designed to preserve your instincts um has become hijacked so and in that case can i ask you on that point because you said that people with it like more uh, you know um are leaning towards addiction they've got a special kind of brain why is it then some people 
don't get addicted to things and other people do, or maybe I'm wrong and there's a spectrum and that actually everybody's susceptible to some extent. Sure. So if you look at me as an example, um, I took amphetamines for 25 years as prescribed. Mm -hmm. Um, I became dependent on amphetamines. I could not function well without amphetamines, but I wasn't addicted to them. Yeah. I still went through withdrawal when I stopped taking them. And that process took almost a year. Yeah, wow. Well, very, a hard, very challenging. Hard year. Yeah, 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 exactly. Crazy. Um, like my wife said to me like 10 months in, she's like, Yeah, you were really depressed. And I didn't even I didn't even notice. Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> just like, didn't know. Oh, yeah, 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 that's why. I was in a bad way. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think that you um, so that's what dependent the difference between dependence and addiction is like, you know, someone breaks their leg, has a hip replacement, um, they're given dilated in the hospital, you know, um, they get off the pain meds, they struggle to get off the pain meds, but they get off of them and they're like, I never want to take an opiate again. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's dependence. Right. That's not addiction. Right. The addict can't stop. So regardless of whether they want to or not, they can't stop. So so why do some people have more, you know, of a leaning towards addiction and some not? Is that hard to say? Is it is it possible to say? I are think, we are we all like to be addicted to something at some point just because of the sort of brains we have? Yeah, it's a hard thing to answer. I think I think that, I mean, genetics definitely play a role. Like if you shake my family tree, a bunch of addicts come out. It's just a reality. Um, some people don't have much addiction in their family. And then some of them- so That's interesting. Addicted. That suggests it's either then genetic or is it the environment that's in that culture of the family? That's hard to know, isn't it? Like so what psychology is there and what's genetic? Or are they also both linked? We look at it like addiction is a primary disease. Mm-hmm. Most of the diseases that metabolic diseases that we try to treat um, are symptoms to the primary illness, right? So when I treat a food addict, I don't look at diabetes like it's an illness. I look at it like it's a symptom. Yeah. I look at cardiovascular disease like it's a symptom. When you treat the root cause, the symptoms go away. Mm -hmm. So we believe that it's inherent. I mean, there are some people that are addicted and some people that aren't. Um, and, um, and they're just different. I don't, I try not to get too far into the cycle babble. Cause I think, I think <laughs> a lot of people end up in this, what bit my mentor bitten calls analysis paralysis. They yeah, end up yeah. so focused on the why. Um, and then they know nothing about the how and yeah. what they really need are action steps that they can take, um, to help them move past, um, initial you know the initial recovery into a place where they can build a sustainable life um but this so stuck like you know you hear people that are this like they're too smart for their own good you yeah. know i've had patients that are just like like they can intellectually run marathons around me yeah but they can't put one and one together that they need to stop and that means that they can't do this 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 and this like they don't see it um they don't see the little steps. They're too they're too far ahead to live in the present moment because you have to stay in recovery in, in the present moment. Um, so I well, think well, let's come on to recovery because I think that's going to be interesting to go into. Incredible. Mm. So good. Delicious, really. Yum. Really good. Mm. Oh, so tasty. Mm. So before I get to that stage, can we talk a bit about sugar and carb addiction in particular? Sure. So how do you diagnose someone with having a sugar or carb addiction? And I've heard you mention previously about the carb curve, is it? Um, is it like a scale you use? Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, so the first thing I'll tell you is that there's there's a tool called sugar, 
which is designed based on the ICD-10 um, and the DSM-5 criteria for substance abuse. And it literally takes people through the questions that an individual would be asked if they were coming in for substance and alcohol abuse, but it's for food. Right. Oh, okay. Like, so have you eaten more than you intended to? Have you eaten longer than you intended to? You know, um, has your addiction basically gotten in the way of you doing things for your life? You know, yeah. are there consequences? Have you, do you have physical symptoms of withdrawal when you stop? Right. Have you tried right. to use sweeteners in place of sugar to avoid withdrawal or because you needed something sweet? So it's, right. they're just the same question. You're just oriented um, that way. There are some other tools uh, that are, I think, less comprehensive. And like you have the, there's a research-based tool called the Yale Food Addiction Scale. Um, for the clientele that I work with, I find that it underreports, but that's just me. Right. Um, and um, a lot of people have success with the tool in, in research, but it is it is a research-based tool. Then you have something called the Uncope which was designed for alcohol. It's a six question questionnaire. Um, you also have the cage, which is another um, tool that's used for alcohol. It's a four question questionnaire. Um, so it's a screening tool. Um, it's, it's probably as a tool, it's more likely to indicate who needs help um, than to like, if you need to see a counselor or if you need a group to support you, then to help you figure out like how addicted you are. Right. How, okay. how severe is it? So the sugar tool basically maps out the progression of your specific disease of addiction over the course of your life chronologically. Wow. Amazing. And yeah, I still find it interesting that it's not really identified as being an addiction to so many people, which is incredible because it sounds with those tools that's scientific that's not just an opinion is it that's actually somebody saying well if you answered yes to all these questions for alcohol or narcotics then look you've done the same thing for sugar well then you can see it must be an addiction surely right and yet and still um you some of the people that you meet i mean the denial is so thick like the disease doesn't want to die so yes. and yeah. it's in our instinct system so uh how do you cut through that and and that's why I think community is one of the best ways for people to recover because they 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 get rid of the white noise that they're used to experiencing in their head like um, like you're lousy, you're worthless, just eat, you'll feel better. Like this is languaging messaging that we're receiving constantly during the day um, as an addict, and and you start to believe it, and so wow. it becomes harder and harder for you to stop, even if you want to. Yeah. Well, wanting is nothing to do with it, is it? That's the thing. Like you just said, you know, it's, it's, it's powerful feelings that are going on inside you that have nothing to do with thought whatsoever, are they? And, you know, you can't, you can't rationalize yourself out of them. You probably have to just talk about it to vocalize it. Right. Right. And you that, can't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause you can't yeah. think your way out of it. It's not possible. You have to act your way out of it. Yeah. But you're also too much in it to know the metacognition of what you're thinking and feeling as well. Well, wow, exactly. Complex. You lose your, your perspective is totally warped. Yeah. So people you're working with, that when they're in that state with their sugar addiction or whatever, and you said they might be really intellectual and, and intelligent, what sort of damage are they doing to the lives that you've come across, if that's the case to talk about? And and is it hard you for them like to You mean consequences? Not... Yeah, consequences. Yeah, exactly. And, and secondly, stopping something is one thing, but staying stopped is quite another, right? So how do you help people to not only give up whatever their addiction is, in this case, sugar or carbs, but also live a life for the rest of their lives where they feel like they've got abstinence. And I assume abstinence is the answer. So how do you get them to that stage? That seems like a hell of a challenge. Sure. I, I think abstinence is my answer. Um, you know, I kind yeah. of, I think that's one of the tools that we use in our community. Um, I think that it, it enables the brain to recover but it's not everyone's answer. I mean, there are situations where abstinence could be harmful. Like if someone has um, a severe history of call it like dieting noise, eating disorders, you know, this could potentially exacerbate that. Um, right, right. Because of its level of 
I don't want to say strictness because it's not really strict. It's kind of more freeing than strict, but um, sometimes that structure is liberating for individuals. Like some people find like weighing and measuring to be like a burden. Yeah, and other dude. people find weighing and measuring to be like, oh, this is my food. I don't have to worry about anything else. Yeah, I don't get funny, enough. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's two sides. So in terms of let's try to go into <clears> the consequences <throat> first. I mean, yeah, I think it's any consequence on, on metabolic disease plus there's really, I think, brain damage. Um, so, you know, amputations, um, blindness, kidney damage, dialysis, you know, weight, obesity, arthritis, Alzheimer's, you know, um, acne, all, all this stuff I think could potentially be derived based on the food that people eat, which is derived from their addictive impulses. Um, and so w- one of the tools that we end up using is something called, like, I call memory of the pain versus the fantasy of moderation. So that is essentially you creating a visceral vignette of the pain that you've suffered or the potential pain that you could suffer. And we use that to fight against our fantasy that we can moderate because, because I can have just one, right? Absolutely not. I don't know how to have yeah. one of anything. I think that's why my mom <laughs> says a person of more, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so that's a fan, the fantasy that I can moderate. And whenever that thought comes running around in my head, I can look at my memory of the pain. So whether it's for someone, they might keep a cane in their car. You know, maybe someone needs to get a seatbelt extender on an airline. Um, maybe they can't get on the floor and play with their grandkids. But it needs to be powerful enough to combat the fantasy that we can have just one. Yeah, you're so, so right. It needs that. to be personal. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And actually, memory of where you've been in that situation before is so helpful. So I'm going to share a little bit about my story. And then before we get on to how do you keep somebody who's also you sure, know, sure. stopped, um so okay so so, several things really so firstly moderation is misery for me um you know i i I, same as you i can't i can't moderate an addiction which i suspect i have because well like you just said exactly that point you know one is never enough uh it, it leads to more and it doesn't matter if you're full you want the thing in fact i've been the sort of person who's eaten uh quicker to to get as much of it in my body than I could feel the pain of being full. So that's clearly a bad sign on your, you said about the questions earlier on, I thought, yeah, that flashed up for me, certainly. So, you know, um, and it's certain types of food for me. So, you know, I would love a rice dish, for instance, and I would eat that as much as I could, knowing I'm going to get really full and then feel bloated and distended and, and horrible. Whereas I could finish eating a steak and not feel that way. So it's a volume thing, but it's a very much about the food type. And certainly bread can be really triggering for me like that. Sure. Um, I said in a podcast actually recently, uh, yes, yeah, with Richard Morris, actually, um, the two and the keto dudes. And I said, you know, if I have a crumpet or something today, that, that sounds really English, doesn't it? If I have a, a piece of toast, God, this is like become really twee suddenly. Because um, you're American, I'm trying to be a bit cooler now. Um, if, <laughs> if, I, if I have toast today... I mean, just normal bread, not like a low carb bread, then I know that I'm eating toast tomorrow or carbs tomorrow. So there's a pattern there. It's not like a, right. it's not going to be a one off event. I can't just have, I mean, I can eat ice cream and not think about it ever again, but something like bread, I eat it the next day, I want bread. And my body's like, come on, it's bread time. We're going to have bread. So that's yeah. definitely a weird pattern I can identify with. And thirdly, and I, I don't know if this relates to what you just last point you were making there. Uh, this very week we're recording, so today's what Tuesday of the week, um, and we have a fasting group on my UK Low Carb um, Facebook group. You're all welcome to join, by the way, Dave. And on there, we're doing a five-day fasting window. And in September last year, I did the full five days, and it was easy, if I'm honest. It wasn't difficult for me. I did have a bit of a headache, and one day I think it's electrolyte-based. But apart from that, I was absolutely fine. However, day six, seven, and eight, when I was back to eating again, it went just mad. I was, well, I was like, you know, the chimp in me, the limbic brain was like, "We're eating, guys! Come on!" And I felt like I had a free pass to do what I wanted. Sound the alarms! Yeah, 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 it was ridiculous. 100%. I was like, "What am I? Doing? This is madness!" So this time, I've just done a twenty-four hour fast because that is that's that's doable for me. Um, sure. 
And I thought the challenge wasn't going to be that. I really thought the challenge was going to be the amount of time I'm not eating, but it wasn't. It was the it's the massive party in my brain afterwards saying, You've got you could do what you like, you can just eat anything, it's fine. You've done five days, reward yourself, you deserve this. You know, it was all that sort right, of stuff. Sure, sure. So I've I've had to realize I have to be very careful with that sort of abstinence, that's actually worse for me. So, yeah, um, so on your just, scale, where are you going to put me? <laughs> so just quickly, I would say um, just about fasting, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are a lot of health benefits to fasting. There are a lot of consequences, too. So, you know, we have to put it on the spectrum of ourselves. And so when I'm working with a food addict who wants to fast, I want to know why they want to fast. Um, so, for instance, yeah. the only reason... I do some intermittent fasting, and I will tell you why. It is the only thing that enables me to focus without amphetamines. So, yeah, okay. so if I eat one meal a day at dinner, my focus during the workday is great. Yeah, okay. which is a completely I very, very valid During the workday, yeah. I have no focus. So wow. I'm treating a medical problem with fasting. Yeah. So I think it's very important for an addict because fasting is an outlet. It's restricting. Mm -hmm. So um, – and then you say an eating window, right? But what you were describing was really a binge window, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and that's true for me too. Like if, when I yeah. come out of a fast, I have to be really conscious that I'm not – Dave, you're in recovery, you know? Um, yeah. You have yeah. to You have to manage this. So – um, it's, it's a really a valuable point. I mean, where are you on the scale? We'd have to do it, you know, um, it's the only way to know, but, uh, because it, it sounds like you have some tendencies. Um, I don't want to tell you you're an addict. I would, and if, if someone did the assessment, I would say, based on this assessment, it appears that you meet criteria, um, for pathological use of food. Yeah, so yeah. because I'm not I'm not labeling you as an addict. I'm yeah. just basing it on the tool. I yeah, it's not personal important. then, is it? It's like, you know, this is you answer these questions. This would suggest from data that this is the it's answer. Objective. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's important, isn't right. it? Oh yeah, and you're you're totally right there, of course. Um I think you talked about before um was it romance guilt and debate was it yes, i heard you yeah. say and yeah can you, can you describe that a little bit more because i think that's an interesting area yeah so definitely about. it's definitely something i wanted to talk about i think one of the biggest tools that we have at sugar global is what we call a trigger-free triangle so it helps us identify what our trigger foods are so if yeah. there's any food that causes you to feel bad about yourself after you eat it it's a trigger right so that's guilt yeah and then debate do you think about whether you should or shouldn't consume it. Oh, I don't know. You're going down the aisle. You're like, mm -hmm, mm hmm. Yeah, don't eat it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it causes cravings. And then romance, which is like, like, it's like the anticipation. Um, we call it the rendezvous, meeting our secret lover and dark and alone. You know, maybe you hide the wrappers. Yeah, um, you like just you put it like bags, under yeah? under yeah. rubbish in the bin, you know. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. You guys would say, you it's know, the uh, illicit affair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I see what you mean. Yeah. So if so, you see those behaviors in yourself, that suggested that there's a problem there, isn't it? Well, at least it identifies that um, there's those are trigger foods, right? Yeah. And and the answer is in my book to remove cravings to not eat the foods that cause cravings because it's it's the food now. Yeah. I preface that by saying that in terms of recovery, the food is like maybe five or ten percent. Like getting the food right is five or ten percent. And I think the low carb community does a relatively good job about getting the food. Yeah. But it misses um, I think a lot of it, it misses the point that this is a, a biochemical progressive and chronic brain illness that must be treated. And, and that was one of the questions you asked was, how do we stay in recovery? So yes, in the exactly, clinical yeah. addiction world, they call it relapse prevention. Right. We hate that. I right. hate that. It's negative. It sounds yeah, it is, just isn't like, it? Yeah. doesn't it just sound like work? You're keeping just, up the tent a little bit longer before it collapses. And yeah, just yeah. Keep so it up, we, you know. we have switched it and, um, and we call it recovery protection. Um, to put up more of a positive spin on it. And, and, 
And is it the same thing? Yeah, it pretty much is. But the terminology and and I think the stance um, is different. And so, you know, one of the ways that's that I think people overlook in terms of fighting their addiction is feeding your recovery. Right. So there's a story of you know a grand a grandson goes to his grandfather and, and his grandfather talks to him about these two wolves that live with inside him. This is an old Native American parable, and um, and he explains that you have a wolf of peace and calm and tranquility and and mindfulness and hope and wisdom, and you have a wolf of anger and judgment and resentment um, and fear and anxiety. And he says, which one wins? And the grandfather says, um, which the one you feed, the one you feed when the one you choose to feed. Right. So one of the easiest ways to stay in recovery is to feed your recovery. Right. Oh, as, a res- way at it. As, yeah, a, as a result of feeding your recovery, you starve out your disease. Um, but this isn't just something you do on Tuesdays. This is something you do every day. So you intertwine recovery building activities into your day, whether it's going to a support group, whether it's making a commitment for the day, you know, whether it's doing some mindfulness meditation or doing some writing or, um, you know, any of these positive practices, affirmations, um, visualizations, like all these things are helpful, uh, but we need to make sure that they become structured to part of our day. So we can use things like chaining. Chaining is like you would take a behavior that you want to add into your day, but you would attach it to something you already do. So, oh. So, like, every time I drink tea, I'm going to exercise. I'd be ripped <laughs> in no time. I'm a tea addict in a good sense. I just adore it. I'm not giving up ever. That's just for me for life. And if I exercise at the same time as drinking tea, I'd be exhausted for about a year. But and after burn. that, <laughs> I'd be ripped. Yeah. Yeah. I've so, got a tea yeah, here. I'm just thinking about it now. I'm going to start working out at the same time. Attach, okay. Yeah. Attach it to something like, for instance, like putting your toothbrush in the shower to help you brush your teeth in the morning, you know? Um, right, right. You know, maybe you have a hard time remembering your phone. Put it in your shoe. You know what I mean? Just like things that yeah, yeah. you you have no excuse. It's right there. It's part of your day. You know, you hear about people praying in the shower, for example. You know, if that's yeah. your bag, super. Um, yeah. Just make it part of your day. You hear about people uh, who roll out of bed and they pray just because of just the first day. of doing it. You know, it's just chaining. You're attaching it. You have to get out of bed. Um, so that's you know, the next process. You're kind of nearing the ground as you stand up. Just do it then. So, so I've, I've heard those the counting thing as well. So the thing I learned in the chimp paradox, somebody said, was to overcome that limbic brain, the, the chimp yeah. brain, was if you can't get out of bed in the morning, just say, right, I'm on five, I'm out of bed. One, two, three, four, five, sure. up, and just do it before your brain even has the chance to kick in to right. say, stop, I want to lie back in bed. It's much more comfortable. Just those little counts and stuff really, sure, really I help, think, don't they? And Mel Robbins has the five, four, three, two, one which I think is even better, but oh, yeah. Like, everyone go. Then. Yeah. Right. So, so it's you just the same as you, down and, you counting yeah. backwards. Yeah. Cause like yeah. lift off. So a lot of our clients use that. Um, yeah, you're right. Cause I might go six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm counting. Yeah, a million, that's what I do. And it's 10 I'd be in the morning. There, I'd be at like 213. <laughs> I'd be like, what happened? <laughs> now, if you square it, we can be here longer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Good point. Dave. The hypotenuse uh, point. is, yeah, no, don't. <laughs> Right, because that's <laughs> let's leave analysis that. paralysis, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Our, our chip brains love that. So, can I just ask you a question about community? Because you said there yeah. before chaining about community, and it seems to me if you look at the um, the Portuguese studies into narcotics, are very interesting, I think, because didn't they uh, decriminalize drugs um, and they they tried to put in community programs uh, to try and replace some of the sort of judge, uh, drug legislation that they had? And it seems to be addiction went down from the community-based projects. So how can community make a difference here, the connection between us and other addicts or people who can listen and empathize with us? Yeah, so I'm not actually familiar with those studies. I'll have to read them. They sound interesting. Yeah, you know what? I, I don't really know where I stand on drugs. I, I'm kind of more pro at being illegal. And I'm, I don't, I've don't. i never done drugs. I don't know much about it. But it's just very interesting when you find a study where actually it was quite an optimistic, hopeful thing rather than a negative locking people away thing which doesn't seem to have an answer this is actually about helping people really connect but anyway we, we can leave that for now but yeah tell me about community yeah, I think and the there's connection a divergence in the addiction world between abstinence and harm reduction so right um i'm an abstinence guy i'd be the first person to tell you and if i told yeah. you that i didn't have any biases i would i would be completely lying i 
everyone has a bias. I mean, yeah. we're all opinionated, you know? And, and so, um, I think that harm reduction in certain situations can be useful. Um, but it's not something that I practice necessarily. Yeah. Like there may be maybe staging people down, like people who are full money sugar addicts and they give up pop and then they give up toast, you know, and then they give up rice and corn and, you know, you know, like that can be helpful for, in my opinion, if there's, if they're staging their way towards abstinence, right. um, but I don't work through a harm reduction model. Um, and you had mentioned the carb curve and that's what the carb curve is kind of finding where your carb needs to be and kind of staging yourself down if necessary. Um, and then, okay. So community, um, I think community is, is the backbone of the recovery that we provide individuals with. I think when you find yourself surrounded by a pack of individuals that can help and support you and can understand you, because if I try to describe my disease of addiction to a room of people that understand addiction, you get a lot of nods, right? And, and you get a lot of identification. And I think identification is so important, identifying with each other. Like, even if I haven't yeah. gone to the lengths you've gone, I can identify with the way that you thought about life as a kid. I can identify with the way you reacted to the way that your parents yelled at you or, or, um, you know, having a hard time in college. Like I can identify with that. Like it's not necessarily yeah. part of my story, but I can like relate. Yeah. I'm yeah. nodding, you know? And, and I think when you have that in community, you have power. Um, you have, you're not alone anymore. I think addiction is, we say isolating and alienating, you know, it, it, it's going to make me all alone and it's going to alienate everything I believe in. I'm going to be doing things against my will, mm -hmm. things that are, like you said, potentially illegal. Yeah. Um, you know, it's only dangerous. All yeah, of them are dangerous, aren't they? I don't really? know. <laughs> it's funny. I don't think the legality really matters to an addict. So, oh yeah, it doesn't, uh, does it? Of course right, not. No. So I don't know how helpful <laughs> it is one yeah. way or the other. Uh, you know, it's like I think they try to take. They try to look at. Um, Okay, so the drug problem isn't a supply problem, right? So they they try to eliminate the supply. So you can't get new addicts. To what it. happened? Yeah, nothing happened. It got yeah. worse. It's a demand problem. The addict needs a drug. Well, well, yeah. Although to be fair, I mean, if you look at like America, the um, opiate drugs that were given out prescribed drugs that are given out in the 90s they seem to have is it oxycontin and drugs like that they seem to really cause a huge problem where people who would never have maybe have tried drugs before suddenly were for pain relief they were made into addicts very quickly and now they have to buy their drugs illegally that's that's tragic isn't it that, that happened. right but it's still the demand still demand yeah 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 you know, you're quite right you're quite right yeah yeah um, yeah yeah and i mean i certainly don't have the answer i have the answer for me um, yeah, we have yeah. a community filled with people who are finding the answer for them, but I think that um, yeah, it's complicated. It's really complicated. But the difference there is as well. Something like narcotics is, you know, in our country, it's illegal. Socially, it's not acceptable. Uh, I was raised in a family who were just like, you just don't touch drugs, so we didn't. Um, food, on the other hand, is so much more complex because right, not only pervasive. is it socially, yeah, yeah, it's pervasive, and it's also. Something that's socially not only accepted but encouraged. You know, so sugar it's also is a great entertainment. Example. It's entertainment, exactly. It's your birthday, have some sugar. You've just done really well at something, have some sugar. Um, you just had a massive great meal for like a big celebration, eat some sugar at the end to, but I to mean, like, show food, your love, you know. The food is designed to be entertainment. Like to oh, I see what you mean. Us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, an entertainment mouth. industry. Yeah. It's crazy. That's very true, actually. Walk down the cereal aisle. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they certainly yeah. aren't showing you pictures of cereal. Yeah. Did you know, by the way, Dave, a bit of a side note here, do you know that Tony the Tiger is actually apparently not uh, the made to target children, according to Kellogg's? Um, oh, because they're worried about getting taxed. It's actually for millennials who like to have a bowl of cereal after a long day at work or college or something. And so really? they have Tony the Tiger to be their tiger millennial friend who just wants to chill with them on the sofa or, or couch, sorry. I um, love that. Yeah, isn't that interesting? That's interesting. Uh, it's funny. I just I get really annoyed with all these kids who get that wrong and think it's for them. You know, it's really grating that. And what about uh, the what about the tricks bunny? Who's he for? 
Uh, probably sixty year olds. Oh, okay. um, yeah, they all are. You know, it's like <laughs> Mickey sells cigarettes to forty year olds. I don't know, but um, <laughs> so that's not true. I just want to say that to Disney now. So, okay, one thing I want to ask you about then is sweeteners because I run a sure, low carb sure. bakery, and I think it's an important topic to come across. Oh yeah, let's um, talk about it. Yeah, because I think it is important because. Okay, this is my perspective on this. So I'm not addicted to sweet things, sugar at all. I don't feel a craving for that. Sure. Carbs, on the other hand, I do. And so I like to have something sweet now and again as a little bit of a, you know, a nice, pleasant experience. Or, you know, I do like to celebrate a birthday party and not give my kids sugar. So it's a good option for me to have that. Um, but some people, on the other hand, clearly, they do have an addiction to whatever sugar's doing to them. And maybe, like you said earlier on, they're using a sweetener to have the same experience. So maybe in that case, it's probably something that they should abstain from. What, what's your position on sweeteners and things? Yeah, it's just always a loaded question for me. You know, I think I think that um, we need to individualize care for folks, right? So um, – one way you can look at it is so one stance is that sugar is heroin and sweeteners are methadone. Okay. <laughs> well, that's okay. one, one, that's way. one yeah. stance, right? Yeah. That's aggressive. Um, Depends on your starting some, point as well, right? Because right, 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 right. not, it's not heroin for me. So, some, you know. people, some people need a band aid mm. for a little while. You know, they need something to help them get off of the other stuff. Like, I have clients that. Um, would never have been able to get off of sugar if they didn't use sweeteners, at right. least at the start. So, it's a bit of so a bridge to me, them. that's okay. Um, but if it becomes the drug itself, then it's not helpful. Yeah. Um, I think we have to look at what's important to us um, in the moment. And that changes too, right? So you notice like there may have been things that you ate before that you don't eat now. I mean, we're constantly evolving. So, you know, um, there were foods that I used to eat that I, that I don't eat anymore. Um, and vice versa. So, um, you kind of have to find where you're at and, and go from there. So I don't really have a hard stance. I do find Um, That people who have given up sugar and flour and grains and other foods that have an addictive capacity for a period of time, they've given up all these things and they go to give up sweetener and they go through a deeper withdrawal. Right. So it's almost like the last thing they're letting go of, which is where there's the most painful. Well, it may be. I just think that um, like I had given up sugar, alcohol. And then I gave up caffeine, right? Right, and, right. Like it was not all at the same time. Um, and then when I gave up caffeine, like that was my one of my hardest detoxes. Um, and I was drinking maybe three cups of dark coffee a day. Like it wasn't a huge amount of coffee, but it wrecked me. So everyone's different. Yeah, and it's not that's interesting. It's not just um, it has nothing to do with what is the substance. It's more of like, what is our experience with the substance? So for folks that use sweeteners, um, I think that it, if it works for you, it's okay. Um, but if it's not working, you have to be willing to look at it. Yeah, that's really true. I think that's it's a really mature answer you gave there because I suppose – know yourself that's like an ancient greek expression isn't it but it's so it's so true though isn't it if you know thyself and how you work and what things are not good for you what things are good for you you can find your your path then can't you but i think it's got to come down to that knowledge and then freedom to choose and i mean real freedom to choose or free from addiction and i guess knowing sometimes this thing sweeteners sugar whatever it might be is actually the thing that's stopping me choosing because it's it's hijacking me we need to tell the truth to ourselves about yeah. ourselves, yeah. right? So um, if <clears throat> if you're willing to to look at that and see the writing on the wall for you and take the action steps based on that information, then you're in a good place. You know, but and, who and knew maybe, though, Dave? That's harder to tell yourself the truth than it is to sit in your loved ones, isn't it? I can see in my wife or my children or my parents or whoever, you know, they've got an issue with that, or I don't like the way they do right, this. Right. But, but quite often for yourself, you don't see it and they don't see it in themselves because 
they are in their head experiencing what's going on. Then enters the community where you start to see yourself in others. Genius. You've tied it together beautifully there, mate. I love that. So like when I hear my buddy Dan or, or someone in our circle, you know, say like this and this, and I'm like, Oh crap. That's me too. Isn't it? (laughs) You know, for some (laughs) reason, the, the, it makes it easier to admit. That's and, really And then true. you reach out to them and then they're like, yeah, yeah. You identify with that? All right, let's do something about it. You know, it's just, it makes it so much easier because when you're all alone in an island, right? You're, you're all alone on an island, you know? There's no mirror. It's you, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, so in it's that dangerous. case, I, I heard something, this just came back to me just now and you said that. Do you know, there's a, um, I don't know why you would know him, there's a guy called Frankie Boyle. He's a comedian from Scotland who was big here about 10 years ago and he does a few programs now and again. And I heard him on a podcast about six months, a year ago. And and he said something quite quite sad, really. He said he's an alcoholic and he's been in recovery for 10 years or so. Mm-hmm. And I think he used to be a heroin addict as well. Okay. Um, and he said on Twitter, he would have a, like a few people a week or a month contact him to say, right, I've got to the stage of my life. I want to give up the, the drugs. I want to give up the alcohol, whatever it was. And he would then start DMing them and, and helping them. Yeah. He then said, this is what I thought was really sad, as soon as the first pandemic hit, kind of March 2020, those messages dropped off completely and they they stopped coming in and it's been quiet ever since. And he said he thinks it's really sad that the pandemic maybe has meant that people aren't reaching out so much as they used to or maybe they're feeling so desperate they're kind of stuck in their addictions. But from what you just said there about community being so important and you can identify because hopefully somebody listening to this can identify what I'm saying that can help them a little bit. But it's nothing the same experience as being in the same room with people face to face, is it? And how, how, in your opinion, has the pandemic had an impact on this kind of therapy and for the help that people can actually get? I think, I think that it goes both ways. Um, I think that in many ways it strengthened the recovery movement because it's um, it's it's been distance is is an obstacle which the pandemic completely eliminated because a lot of things just went online. Um, So there's that. Um, And like, I've had the opportunity to speak all over the world um, because of the pandemic about, you know, about recovery. And, and, and the other thing is, yeah, you know, if you're not in a room with someone, you can't experience their energy and in the same way. Um, Although, there are a lot of people that have gotten sober or clean or whatever you want to call it for whatever drug you're using, whether that's food or alcohol or narcotics, or it doesn't matter really, or behavior, um, just with zoom. Um, I had a woman, I started a group, um, around basically I was working in a nursing home. I went to low carb Denver. I came home and because I traveled, my work wouldn't let me work for like two and a half weeks. Right, so I said, right. what am I going to do with my time? Oh, I'm going to start a group. We're going to meet every day because because everyone's adjusting with the pandemic. We're going to meet every day for a week. And then I switched it over. We meet we meet at 4 p.m. Eastern every Thursday. And we've been meeting since last March. Right. So a year and a half, right? There are yeah. people that literally have just gotten sober by going to that group. Wow. Um, so that still, has like, nothing to do with me. That has to do with people being open and honest and vulnerable and supporting each other, just being present. So I think we need to make sure that we're not manufacturing excuses. Um, mm. And and um, honestly, the recovery space on Twitter is really powerful. You know, there's like okay. a hashtag recovery posse, you know, and um, and uh, I've connected with people from all over the world and and. Um, I think it's it's a it's a very warm community where people are people are counting days, whether it's from drugs or alcohol or sugar or whatever. And That's people amazing. are like rallying around them and and like my tagline is always like if someone says something like that, I always I always write, I believe in you. I don't think enough people hear that message. Mm. You know, because I believe in you. I do. I, I believe that with what I've been through and what I see other people go through, anything is possible for anybody. Um, I've seen, I've seen people, 
my I think about my friend Steve. He's well, like 400 pounds. He's a recovered alcoholic. He's a recovered drug addict. He had to have all his teeth knocked out, you know, in order to get um, dentures. I mean, he's been through like everything. Um, yeah. He was like a hardcore narcotic addict. I mean, and he's been clean from drugs and alcohol over 30 years and from food for like four years. Wow. He's like a miracle. If he can do it, anyone can do it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a matter of coming and manufacturing the willingness one day at a time, like just for today. I One of my favorite mantras is just for today. I'm not going to put anything in my body that will harm me physically, mentally, or spiritually. Right. And that could mean food. It could mean certain relationships, um, could be stress. So it could be any of those things. So just having the willingness to do it today is monumental because I can't, I don't know. I can't recover tomorrow. I can only recover today. Yeah. You can only live today. Recover, how am I going to recover today? Yeah. You can't even think about tomorrow because it hasn't happened yet. And you've got to let go of the past. So I truly believe that. I think you can only oh, yeah. live in the today, in the moment and, and, and think, are you empowered or not? And what can, what choice can you make now? And what choice are you free to make? Um, Dave, before I get on to some of these events and things that you, you run and how they can connect with you, is it fair to say that you have a more empathetic understanding of humanity because of your career? Empathetic. I mean, <laughs> I think I'm more empathetic because I'm an addict in recovery, never mind my career um, or my training. I think that, um, like, some people might experience miracles like, like relatively infrequently, you know, um, I get to experience miracles all the time. Um, like daily I see, I see amazing things. You know, I see people thought patterns changing, transitioning, um, transitions. I mean, just this morning it was, we were on a, we have a, in our community, we were running a book club. Um, you're going through Russell Brand's book recovery. Um, oh yeah. Kind of his interpretation of the 12 steps. And we aren't a 12 step community, which we have some people that are, you know, they cross mingle, but, yeah. um, but like watching people, minds just open. I mean, mm. people with closed minds having open minds, like to me, that's a miracle. Like yeah, their ability to enter, welcome in a new way of life. So does that give me empathy? Yeah. But if you look at the root of the word compassion, if you break it down in Latin, it's cum it's pain, patos, it? right? It's, it's with pain, pain with suffering, yeah. right? So it's that suffering that makes us able to have compassion. Yeah. So, so yeah, there's no, there's nothing in my mind more compassionate than an addict in recovery. So and you hear a lot, just one more thing, you hear a lot on mm -hmm. Twitter, you know, people say, oh, I was addicted to sugar. I don't understand that. I just, because you still are. Yeah, um, yeah. What happens when it comes back into your system? Well, <clears throat> we don't want to find out. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I think it's, it's an illness and it's, we say it's chronic, it's progressive and it's fatal, right? It's chronic, yeah. it's here for the long run, it's progressive, it gets worse, um, fatal, it can kill you. Yeah, you know what? You you've really touched me today. It's been um the same about what you said there about vulnerability that like, really got to my core because I think in a way it is stripping over the the layers and the defenses and just being honest with yourself and actually saying, This is you, this is what's going on. And I think, yeah, that empathy and compassion to yourself as well, going through your own pain with yourself is really important, isn't it? And it it's made me kind of question and think a lot about things I need to do in my own life. So uh, thank you from a personal point of view there, Dave. That's, no, that's my pleasure. I, yeah, I, I think, think that's that helped somebody we, else as well. We found by accident, like um, we created this nine-week program and uh, we found, and I was actually doing an interview with, with there's a F Food Junkies uh, Summit. It's going on right now. They have a podcast with Your Retirement and Molly Painchlob and Clarissa Kennedy. Anyway, the, um, they're just people in recovery, helping people in recovery. So that they... Um, they asked me during my interview with them, like, what is the one thing that makes recovery possible for people? And I, I didn't have to think about it. It was, it was something that we had found out. And like, a well, I can ask you that question and pretend that I asked it. Well, let me sit in there. Yeah. <laughs> and no, and I think it. it's vulnerability. I think it's yeah. people getting together and willing to open up their heart to others, no matter what level of darkness they believe is in there yeah. and letting that stuff out and, 
and you know we laugh together and in, in our in our circle we cry you know we we do it all but we're vulnerable and we're real and um i think it's really hard to find people uh that are willing to do that and and i think a lot of the relationships that we end up having <clears throat> as humans <clears throat> in this era aren't real um yeah. you know and in you talk i talk to people who are like they're trying to meet friends and you know have real conversations and they can't find people and i'm just like i have this plethora of people because i'm in recovery that i can have real honest conversations with about real things that matter with people yeah. that matter i don't pretend so, to be somebody else either right there's a lot yeah. of that going on isn't there yeah yeah, yeah you well, know we have our days but yeah, exactly. But at least you've got a community and you've got a you've got a culture of doing it. I think that helps, doesn't it? The more you get into the culture of that, the the more it becomes easier, I suppose. It's a practice, isn't it? Um, right. So in that case, can I just ask you then, Dave, about uh, the event that's coming up soon? So the twelfth to nineteenth of October to Kick Sugar Summit. Um, can you tell me a bit more about that and and how people who might be interested could join in with that? Yeah. So the the kick sugar summit is going on uh, very soon. And it's, um, it's run by a woman named Florence Christopher and, and she is, um, a person who has kicked sugar. And so she's bringing all her friends to educate and help and support. And, um, I know I'm going to be there. I know Bitten Johnson's going to be there. I, you know, the, the speaker lineup is incredible. Um, they, um, and, um, I think it gives people an opportunity to, to get their feet a little wet. Right. So I think, kicking sugar is a big deal I mean, it's in everything yeah right and 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 meet meet the professionals that are helping people do that they're going to be coming from all different alleys and avenues they're going to have all sorts of different perspectives um the only thing i preface with if you believe you're a sugar addict you need to make sure that you're getting information from people that understand so you know i i tell everyone this i tell people in my community this all the time if you're going to the summit you know put on your addiction glasses make sure you're right. you're perceiving the information through that lens because if you're hearing a message from someone that's a harm reducer and you know harm reduction doesn't use work for you then you know, you need to take that lens, but it's a really exciting event. And, um, and, you know, it goes on for the week and, and, um, and there's just a ton of support and a ton of community. And I think all those things are really needed. Um, and it, this is a hard habit to kick if you even want to call it a habit. Yeah. Um, it's, definitely. it's insane. I mean, you are talking about, you're talking about a substance that hits your opiate center. Um, it's, it's no joke, is it? That that is no. going to really hit. It's you biochemical hard. warfare. I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And in terms of where people can connect with you and your work, so uh, is Twitter the best place? Or yeah, a Twitter's website? a great place. Um, yeah, you can connect with us at sugarxglobal.com. You know, we have a community we're running, and we are uh, we run a nine week program, which is honestly um, changing people's lives. I mean, it's transforming, and and it's, and it's it's so cool to watch people change um, because they change others. It's a, this is like ripple effect. And, and um, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, we'd love to talk to you. We <laughs> be more than happy to get on the phone and chat for 15 minutes and see if, if, if we're a good fit for you um, and, um, and how we can help you. Even if we're not, I mean, if you want to do this and we like, don't do that, but we know, we know some people that do, we'd be happy to send you that way. Feel like, competition has no place in the space we just need to cooperate yeah um, there's a higher the higher mission and goal here isn't there to help as many Absolutely. people as possible to be a service is such a gift yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i love that okay well thank you so much for that dave it's been a real privilege today to meet you um just want to share everyone uh, his handle it's uh, at dave wolf srx so if you want to check him out there you can and um, yeah, I'd love to talk to you again one day in the future because I feel like there's so many avenues that we could definitely explore a lot more. So thank awesome. you for your time today, Dave. It's been great. My pleasure.